Welcome to Brain Chat with the Nerdy Neurologist. I'm Dr. Mitzi Joy Williams, and I'm your board certified neurologist and MS specialist. My mission is to engage, educate, and empower those affected by MS to become an active part of their healthcare team. Here on Brain Chat, we'll be talking all things MS, health and wellness, advocacy, and we'll throw a little bit of music and music therapy in there as well. Thank you so much for joining us and stay tuned for the next episode. Happy Monday and welcome to Brain Chat. I'm Dr. Mitzi Joy Williams, your board certified neurologist and MS specialist. And I am so excited about tonight's episode. And I know that I say that every other week, but I am really, really excited about today's episode because I have two amazing experts to talk about a topic that we do not talk about enough. We're going to talk about sex. All right. So uh, we're going to talk about intimacy. We're going to talk about having conversations with our partners and with our healthcare team. And I am just really looking forward to this conversation. Um, so you know how we do when we uh, start brain chat, type in the chat where you are viewing us from. Um, thank you so much for taking your time out on this Monday night uh, to talk about this. And, you know, we'll have some time for questions hopefully at the end. So type in the chat where you are logging in from. All right. So while we're doing that, I'm going to start with these amazing introductions. So first I have Dr. Lara Steppelman, who's a PhD and the chief of the psychology department and a chief of psychology in the Department of Psychiatry and Health Behavior and Associate Dean for Faculty Success and Inclusive Excellence at the Medical College of Georgia at Augusta University, my old stomping ground, AUG. She is a health psychologist, focuses her work on teaching and research um, on assisting others to live well with chronic illness, particularly HIV and multiple sclerosis. And that's where we met in the multiple sclerosis clinic there in Augusta. And she's especially interested in access to competent mental health care for individuals living with chronic illness who may have additional barriers to care and experience health disparities related to sexual orientation and gender identity, as well as race and ethnicity. She has published numerous papers related to her clinical interests around sexual health and wellness in marginalized populations. And we have Dr. Ina Ferguson. She is a Christian wife, mother, daughter, sister, friend, clinical psychologist, sexual being, sex therapist, and intimacy coach. And that's a mouthful. And uh, her desire is to receive and give pleasure in healthy, intimate relationships. And she's passionate about helping women who are having trouble finding their own pleasure break the guilt and shame cycle brought about by the church and society so they can transform themselves and have positive intimate and amazing sex lives. She's a graduate of Spelman College, New York University, and and uh, Georgia State University. She has a PhD in clinical psychology and is fully licensed in the state of Georgia. Uh, she completed postgraduate training in sexual health at the University of Michigan, worked for the Department of Defense and the Veterans Healthcare Administration. She is the founder and executive director of Positively Intimate LLC, where she focuses on individual and couple sex therapy, intimacy coaching, transgender and non-binary care, sexual health education, and assessment. All right, so I can see I got folks logging in from everywhere. Let's go. We've got folks from Virginia, South Carolina, Augusta, Georgia. I see my auntie. Hey, auntie. Oregon, Bahamas, North Carolina, Maryland, New Jersey, Chicago, Chi-Town, my hometown, um, Fairburn, Georgia, around the corner, Maine. All right. I think that's the first time I had anybody from Maine, Massachusetts, and Ohio. And I'm sure that we'll have more. All right. So let me bring up my Fabulous guests, Dr. Lara Steppelman and Dr. Ina Ferguson. Thank you so much, ladies, for joining Brain Chat. Thank you and welcome, welcome. Thank you for having us. Definitely. Okay, awesome, Bye. awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, so I know I bring all the energy. Let me bring it down just a little <laughs> bit. Okay, so um, this is a really important topic, and I started doing these talks about intimacy and sexual health with Dr. Uh, Steppelman many, many moons ago uh, in my days at the medical college and certainly have learned so much from her, and I'm excited to have you here. So let's just kind of start by telling us a little bit more about your yourself and kind of the work that you do uh, focused on sexual health 
We'll start with you, uh, Dr. Steppelman, in particularly the MS space. Sure. So, um, so I've been doing work related to sex really for as long as I have been going to school. I actually started in high school uh, doing surveys around sexual uh, behaviors, just really interested in how closed our society off. So we have a very sexualized society, and yet it's very closed in some ways too. And Absolutely. that really prevents, I think, people from having honest communications about what's going on, because we have this sort of like social media, like fantasized sexuality. And what you find for those of us who, as we are getting older or get illnesses or disabilities, is that uh, sex can be one of those things that's very important, but becomes interrupted. And uh, I started that work working in HIV, and then since about 2003, uh, worked with the MS Center here in Augusta, Georgia, and where I became aware of just how uh, how uh, how much sexual dysfunction and sexual challenges and relationship interference MS can really present with, and so it became a real focus of my work there, both in terms of uh, clinical work, uh, but also teaching medical students and residents and faculty about the importance of talking about sex, as well as research and trying to understand more about sort of how we can help people sort of live their best lives within the limitations that they have, including whatever sexual limitations they may have. Absolutely, absolutely. And what about you, Dr. Ferguson? So I guess my journey also started in high school. I was a member of the PG-13 players when I was 15 years old. So I wasn't even old enough to drive, but I was a sex educator. So PG-13 players was part of Planned Parenthood. And we would mm -hmm. go to go to different, um, not colleges, high schools and do skits about sexual health. And, um, and it was a very progressive type of um, type of troop, you know, with Planned Parenthood. Um, and we were even going into schools where abstinence only was being taught as, as their sex education, which is obviously not the um, the model we were going on. But then fast forward, you know, I, I've been doing, I've been a psychologist for over 15 years and I've been, you know, when I work with couples, sex inevitably comes up whenever, mm -hmm. you know, you're working with couples. And a big part of what I did with the Department of Defense was working with um, with couples. And so um, it just morphed over time to the point where it was like, I really need to do some more studying in this area. And so within the last three years, I really got into like the postdoctoral studies and um, and really understanding how to bring how to break that guilt and shame cycle, how to actually have these conversations about sex and intimacy, even in, you know, in a mental health setting where we should be able to talk about everything and we still have issues bringing up sex. So just really getting, being able to talk about sex in a, like, it's, we should be able to talk about it the way we talk about what we're, what we're having for dinner or, you know, how we talk about the weather, or I like that dress on you. I should be able to talk about sex with my friends, with my partner, definitely with all of my medical professionals um, in, a, in a natural way, just like I would talk about anything else. Mm -hmm. So I love that. Let's take a pause there and let's, let's go a little deeper into that. So, you know, as a healthcare professional, I remember being very shy about discussing sex until I started doing some work uh, in the clinic and working with uh, Dr. Steppelman and Dr. Hughes and others, you know, and so how do we kind of break this um, discomfort that people have with talking about it, you know, and even now as I'm a more experienced, you know, clinician, I'm like, you know, I have patients that say, well, I'm really embarrassed. And I'm like, there's nothing to be embarrassed about. Like, you just talk to me about like how your bladder doesn't work or your bowel doesn't work. Definitely. You should be, it's okay to talk to me about that. So how do we kind of break that science, that silence or that, um, you know, that uh, discomfort that people have with talking about it. And then the follow-up to that is how do we as clinicians encourage our colleagues to become more educated so that they have something to say when people bring up these issues um, in order to help kind of navigate or deal with them? I definitely say we have to talk about it more. The more we actually have the conversations, the more we talk about it in our 
personal life, it makes it more, it makes it easier to bring it up, you know, at work um, when you're working with a client or a patient. Um, and, and those conversations need to happen with your colleagues as well. So, you know, when you bring it up in a space that's comfortable, you know, not necessarily a CE, you know, talk, which we should have those as well. But mm -hmm. when you're like continuing education, CE, yeah, continue continue education. Education. Mm -hmm. you should have casual conversations with your colleagues about how do you talk about sex? What are some of the things, issues you're seeing that's coming up over and over again? And how are you dealing with that? That's how you open up the conversation. Absolutely. And what are your thoughts, Dr. Stephan? Yeah, I mean, so I mean, so first, I just want to start with like, the research says that patients expect their providers to talk about sex, like 90% of patients say the doctor should be initiating these conversations. Hmm. And so when they're not happening, we first have to ask, sort of what tone is the physician setting in the room, right? Because what a doctor asks about is what we feel like we have permission to ask about. And mm. so I have found it more the case that it's because the room doesn't have that permission that if you actually mm. ask, you would be surprised how many patients will be able to talk about it pretty graphically and explicitly. Um, and so it's not that there aren't patients who aren't embarrassed about it and certainly educating patients about, look, you know, uh, your sexual functioning is like any other kind of functioning within your body. And if it's not working the way you want and your relationships aren't the way you want, this is a space to talk about it. And so we really do need to do that encouragement. Um, but providers also need to just take that responsibility. We found in our clinics that if we gave a problem checklist, if you just had on the checklist the word sexual functioning, that increased the number of people because all they had to do is check a box. They didn't even have to start the conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I'd, I'd try to like ease into it sometimes. And if they checked a couple other things like getting more exercise, I'd start there. And like, finally, the patient would look at me with their little checklist and be like, no, no, this one. I want to talk about this one. I was like, right, oh, right. you're ready talk about it. So right, let me right. jump right into that. And so yeah. you know, finding those kinds of cues, because obviously even something as simple as the word on a piece of paper is a cue. Right. This is a welcome and inclusive space. And speaking of which, because I know both INA and I do that work, is like it's an inclusive space for anybody to talk about sex. That means right. it doesn't matter what your racial identity is, your gender identity, your sexual orientation, your disabilities, all of those things sexuality is something that belongs to everybody, you know, uniquely within them and, and, and people should be able to talk about it from whatever vantage point they stand in. Yeah. And I like this idea of, you know, uh, I think one of the difficulties as a, um, a clinician who cares for people, particularly with multiple sclerosis, is that sometimes there are so many different issues that we can't even address all of the physical issues. And I think, um, you know, I love the idea of kind of that checklist, because if I think about a review of systems, which is a list of symptoms that patients can check every time they come and see us, there's nothing about sexual dysfunction on there. You know, we have we have questions about the bowel, the bladder, the vision, the numbness, the tingling, the walking. But I rarely ever see anything about sexual health or sexual dysfunction. And so that's definitely something um, that would be easy for us to kind of put in the forefront of our minds if we just ask about it, um, you know, more often. So I really love that idea. So let's kind of dial back for a second and say, what are some of the issues that we see related to sexual um, dysfunction in people with chronic illness like multiple sclerosis, like we think about it. So you and I, uh, Dr. Steppelman, used to do these talks where we would talk about the primary, secondary, and tertiary um, symptoms that we see related to sexual dysfunction with MS. The primary ones being the ones that come directly from nerve dysfunction. So if you have a lesion in the spinal cord and it's causing, you know, abnormal sensation, let's say in the genital area, that obviously would cause discomfort. But let's talk a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the secondary and tertiary symptoms that we see? Uh, sure. So, I mean, if you think about any MS symptom you have, um, and some of these will apply to other chronic illnesses too, they all have the potential to interfere with sex, right? So your mobility, right? Making mm -hmm. effect, uh, 
what positions you're able to get in, how easy it is, that weakness, that would be similar to spasticity can make some positions very uncomfortable. Um, uh, pain, which can, you know, derive from primary or secondary. Uh, a big one is uh, bowel and bladder control and Absolutely. not even, so there's both the actual bowel and bladder control issues of sex, but then also uh, the fear of it. So the anxiety about the potential uh, to, ha- to lose any control during sex can keep people from having sex. And then even like mental things like, so cognition, right? So, so sex requires focus. Uh, for most people, orgasm requires, and particularly for women, orgasm requires focus. And if your mind is like having a hard time pulling it all together because you're tired because it's late in the day, all those things, that can interfere with sex. Not to mention things like depression and anxiety, as well as uh, the body image of being someone right. living with chronic illness and and be not feeling like sexy, right? Because like, you're not feeling all of those things, you know, uh, that we associate uh, with sex of being, you know, agile, being able to move and groove and, uh, you know, moving and grooving may require like, creaking <laughs> and like, <laughs> like joint like, creaking oh, I like get up and switch like, me, like why don't we take a break while I do that let me take a while right, you know, right, joint right. and things like that and so so obviously I, I say that with laughter because I believe when you bring all of those things to the table like you have to have a partner that you can laugh about these things with because because this is just our body doing the things our body does and our body's trying right. to experience pleasure and however we can get there is how we're going to get there. Absolutely. And it doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to be pretty. <laughs> right. We, um, we really need to expand our definition of sex Yeah. because mm-hmm. when we have this very narrow definition that sex is intercourse, we mm-hmm. miss so much of the pleasure that you mentioned, Dr. Sebelman. We, you know, we, we don't get to, really enjoy all of the things that sex can be. Um, And with this, because intercourse may not be, it may not be your jam, right? It might not be what you want. It may not be possible. It may be uncomfortable and painful, like you mentioned. But when we expand that definition, sex can be phenomenal without intercourse. Um, And so a lot of times with chronic illnesses that where you have pain, Um, associated with that, we just have to think about what are other things that make up sex other than intercourse so that we can have, so that we can have this amazing sex life. And then also thinking about intimacy, like we've talked about this a lot in the past, right? Um, Is the goal, does the goal always have to be the big O, right? Can the goal be enjoying that person sometimes and not necessarily I'm a failure if I don't get to this point or if I don't do this particular thing. Can we uh, talk a little bit about that? Orgasm should never be the goal. Orgasm should be a pleasant surprise that comes during your, you know, on your journey of pleasure because you can have amazing sex without an orgasm. Some people, some people who have no chronic illnesses have difficulty with orgasm. Um, And so why make that the goal when, I mean, there shouldn't be a goal. The goal should just be enjoying the moment and the pleasure, not I've got to get somewhere, right? Because right. if you have that sort of, I've got to get to this in place, then that's that narrow definition, again, that's that's really limiting you from experiencing so much more. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree. And also, but also acknowledging because So first of all, orgasms feel really good and like, so people enjoy them. Uh, And so I don't want to also take away from acknowledging like if that's a struggle and something that isn't going to be achieved. I completely agree with INA about sort of the very broad definition, but also if there's a point at which like that just can't really happen for you, that it's also okay to grieve that too and not, uh, you know, and, and then from that grief, learn how to continue to explore all these other things that bring you joy and pleasure. So it's sort of this balance of like, yes, if that doesn't happen for you, it's okay for that to be a loss, but don't stop there. Don't stop there because there's so much more uh, and there's so many ways that you can feel pleasure and people describe all different kinds of things that feel like orgasms and, you know, and 
And so there's lots of ways to experience like intense physical pleasure and emotional pleasure, spiritual pleasure, like it all can come together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that I think that that's hugely important. I think one of the difficulties in this age of social media and so much information at people's fingertips, people can very easily get into this comparison game. Right. Like even some of the groups I'm in, I'm like, man, like, wow, my my life is not like that. You know what I mean? I'm like, let them tell it. It's like a movie every night. And I'm like, yeah, no, it doesn't quite work like that for me. You know, so I think that again, we have to look at our individual situation and not compare ourselves um, and, you know, be able to come to healthy terms with, with our partners about, you know, what we are trying to achieve and what's good and what's not good. Um, so how do people kind of, approach these discussions with partners, right? I think one of the issues that I often find, you know, for my patients who are married, as well as for those who are single, but particularly for those who may be single and are getting into relationships, um, how, what are some tips or some ways that people can kind of, you know, broach this subject and kind of uh, start to um, find this common ground with their partners? I think this conversation needs to start from the very beginning, when you're entering a relationship, you should be talking about sex and you, you know your desires, your um, your absolutes. I need this, or your absolutes. I will not try that. Um, there should be open conversation from the beginning. Now, some people are already in the middle of, of their relationship, right? So they are they they've been in it a long time, and they're like, "Well, we didn't have those conversations before." It's really about who's going to who's going to be the one to just actually say something um, and and bring it up and, you know, and really just be being honest with what it is you want to talk about. What is it that you fear? You know, if you've been in a relationship, sex has been great. You get this diagnosis and you're like, what does that mean for me and my partner and our intimacy and our sex life, which are, can be two different things? Um, that's the time to bring it up. Like, these are the things that I'm fearing. These are the things that I'm thinking about. Um, and I don't, you know, I want us to be able to talk about it continually. Even if you're the partner who wasn't diagnosed, this is what I'm fearing. This is what I'm hoping for. I want to make sure we can continue to talk about it so that it doesn't become this thing in the room, in the house, that's just looming over us. Um, and I think the doctor can help with that conversation as well. If they bring up, if they're able to bring it up, you know, sexual health, it's, you know, it's something to think about. It's something that I'd like for you all to talk about. And if you have questions next time you come in, bring them with you, um, kind of thing. Yeah. And I think That's one of the way. challenges is that most people will initiate these conversations at a point of frustration, which is never a good vantage point from which to like decide now is the time, right? Mm -hmm. So like, you know, either it's because something's not working with you or not working with them the way you want it to be or the frequencies decreased. And like, usually it's not a casual, like I noticed we haven't been having sex as much. I was usually like someone is upset and that's what right. happens. And, and it right. could be, you know, and, and sometimes when we're upset is also a we're upset because like, we're also, it was a day we didn't sleep well, or we were really looking, you know, and so it's the, it might be the end of the day and people are tired uh, and their brains aren't working as well mm -hmm. and they're frustrated. And so, you know, so if you identify those feelings in yourself, that sort of time to take a step back and say, okay, what this is telling me is I need to have a conversation with my partner, not I need to have a conversation with my partner right now. Uh, and that can be hard for some of us. That can, I mean, for me, when I'm feeling it, like I just want to like, but, but I can tell you that that's not the effective time to do this. It's like, take a break, you know, have a nice, you know, over like a Sunday brunch at your home when it's just the two of you and, it's earlier in the day when, you know, with MS that you're feeling more at your best and your meds have kicked in and, you know, really like think for yourself, when is my best time of day to really have these kinds of conversations, you know, and then think about your partner, because maybe that's not the best time. And like, you know, so trying to sort of really think it through of like, when can I talk to this person? And like, and I would say even to the point where like thinking about some things, some key points 
Because the other thing is, is when you finally sit down to talk about it, sometimes uh, you just want to get it all out. So then it becomes this whole, and while we're on it, like, so also doing this sort of narrowing down of like, what's the most important thing I want to walk away from this conversation with? And maybe the only thing you want to walk away from is like, I know something's different here. I want us to like be able to talk about it openly and have it. So even if all you walk away with is the agreement, we're going to talk about this more because we love each other and we want this to be better. That might be enough for the first conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. and so don't feel like you have to like, oh, I finally have that window and like start unrolling your list. Right, your <laughs> like, scroll of the 50,000 things that are wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. If you start off like that, it's not. It's, it's never going to be good. You and know. I think sometimes it's also difficult as a, as a doctor, sometimes I get caught in the middle, you know? So this, you know, I have had issues where like a partner will be sitting there just kind of brooding. And, you know, then we talk about the medicine. They're like, and by the way, you need to tell her she needs to do it more often. And I'm like, mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> like let's back up here. This didn't start today, you know. Um, so I like the idea of kind of you know taking a break from the heat of the situation and kind of sitting down and having a separate conversation, talking about some of those issues and just taking it piece by piece and maybe not trying to unravel the whole thing, you know, at one time. But I think also it also lends back to talking about these things from the beginning, either from the beginning of the relationship if a diagnosis is established or from the beginning of the MS diagnosis once it is established. So let's switch gears and let's talk a little bit about solutions, right? Because everybody knows that there can be problems related to sexual um, health and sexual dysfunction uh, related to MS. Let's talk about solutions. Particularly, um, I want to focus on the ladies a little bit, right? Because the men, you know, we've got some medications that help them out, their procedures, their pumps, there's all kinds of things for the fellas. But for the ladies, you um, they're not as many medical tools that help them. So let's talk about kind of what are the solutions, for instance, if people are having um, symptoms of abnormal sensation or lack of sensation, like in their general area, what, what are some uh, ways that people can combat that or deal with that? So I, I like to recommend vibrators when there's a lack of sensation or when the sensation is low, something that has several settings. So you can start out with a really low setting and work your way up. Um, other toys that may not have vibration, but different, um, you know, you may have a glass, something glass, something silicone, different textures and, and, um, and working with your partner with those, you know, if, if you have a partner working with your partner with those toys can, that's another place where you're opening up, you know, that definition of what sex is and, and explore, have an exploration. Like we're going to start with touch. We're going to advance to different kinds of touch. We're going to use ice or we're going to use one of the toys like and progress and just slight touches getting more and more you know using more and more of the sensation so that you can learn and tell your partner at the moment that they're you know helping you or you you show them you can say i that's okay i don't really like that i really like that do that one more you know have the conversation in the moment while you're trying to figure it out um understanding that it may be the same the next time. It may be different the next time. You may have to start exploring all over again at a different point, depending on how you know how things are progressing with your with your illness. So um, that's just one you know one suggestion of how to deal with the sensation issue. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I would add is I I usually recommend the I mean. So one of the big challenges is, is many of us aren't comfortable with our own bodies and don't actually know like all of the amazing things. Like I learn new stuff every year, like practically every month. I'm like, wow, look what I can do. <laughs> look what I can do. <laughs> like, there's just like, it's a, there's like a never ending. Like, and that's, that's like, like when you open your mind, there's just so much. And like, so what I would recommend also is like, you know, spending time with yourself and whether that mm. is like, masturbation, either manually or with a toy. You know, we talk about body mapping, which is sort of reconceptualizing your body as all of these 
sensual pressure points that like if you find the right things, it could be the inside of your arm or behind your knee, uh, that your body has the potential to feel pleasure in so many places. Uh, mm -hmm. So not only figuring out what works like, you know, vaginally, um, you know, or clitorally, but also then expanding it out and, and figure it out so that you can share it with your partner and you don't get as flustered in the moment because you have some mm -hmm. chance to really know your body and say, wait, when I do it like this, in this mm -hmm. corner, like this, for this long, like, you know, and when they're able to give you pleasure, I mean, so people, you know, people who, you know, care about each other really do want to give each other as much pleasure as they can. And so most people, if they're in good relationships, will be studious learners if you can bring them. <laughs> things and show like them that. Studious and learners. Say, hey, when your tongue goes like this, I, like, that's, and you see my eyes roll back in my head. That's that it. Means, that's that the means spot. more. <laughs> right, 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 right. And I like that idea of, you know, spending time with yourself, right? Because it could be an elbow, you know, it could be a spot back here. You know, there are more spots than just the typical erogenous zones. Like we have a whole body, right? Um, and so I like that idea. Now let's let's dial back for a second, which I meant to talk about first. Let's talk about the role of therapy, right? So I hear a lot about like intimacy coaching, sex therapy. It's not something that I probably was paying attention to 15 years ago, but, you know, I see that this is something that's becoming more acceptable and more um, open. So what is the role of intimacy coaching or sex therapy? When should somebody go to a therapist to talk about these issues? So when, once you get to a point where everything you've tried and talked to, ha, talk to your medical professional, you've ruled out, medical things that could be creating the the issue. So you've already addressed all of the medical stuff and you're still having um, issues. Then that's the point when I say a therapist could come in. Um, but even the therapist could help you navigate how to talk with your um, with your medical doctor if you're ha if you're if you feel like you're hitting a roadblock because not everyone has a Dr. Williams who's freely talking about sex in, in the, um, in their medical, their 15 minutes or 30 minutes you have in there, they're not bringing it, you know, you're, they're not always bringing it up. And so if you ask and you, you know, you're hitting this roadblock, you may need a therapist. If you're, if you're, um, you, you don't have to be in a couple to need, you know, to need intimacy coaching or, or therapy, sex therapy. Mm. You know, I, I run a group for women, um, and some of the women were single, some of the women were in couples, but they, it was all about low arousal, um, women who had a desire to have a good sex life. They had desire to, to have sex, but they, they're just, they weren't able to, um, to get aroused. And so this group, we work on arousal, um, and, and, you know, starting with mindfulness and working our way up. To, and we do the things that Dr. Seppelman was talking about, like exploring your body for yourself, mindful showers where you actually feel the so use your hands instead of a washcloth. Mm. Controversy. I'm taking you notes. Need to pull the washcloth out notes. after the fact, but you use the soap on your hands and you feel every part of your body, starting with your neck, and you wash yourself. And you feel everything, and that's where you know with the slippery part of the soap, you might find. Oh wait a minute, that's a sensation I wasn't expecting, and you explore it some more while you're in the privacy of your shower by yourself. And so, things that we work on as a group, um, as you know, you get homework, we discuss it. That's when you know if if you're at that point where I have tried, I really need some help here. That's when I say you know get into um, get into therapy. What are your thoughts, Lair? And so, I'm talking about sex therapy in particular, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, you know, so obviously whenever you're dealing with a chronic illness and the onset and the challenges that present, uh, I think working with someone to help you navigate that is always a good idea. And certainly with MS, sex is going to come up a, a lot. I mean, I would agree with INA when, when the things you know to do uh, and that you can read about, like, 
And even when you get those things, sometimes people need to be able to talk those through. And so, so I don't think there's ever a wrong time. Like to me, if your sex life is not what you want it to be, um, you, so going into therapy for that, you could even just get a consultation. Like it doesn't have to be that you've now committed yourself to a year of therapy. I've done work with people sometimes where it's just like, like one of the simplest ones I ever did was, you know, this woman was on the verge of divorce from her husband because she didn't want to have sex with him and he wanted to have sex. Well, she was a mom of, with four kids, they were together, but like, and she worked full time and was going to school. And like, every time he'd like give her that look, she'd be like, uh, uh, <laughs> like, have you seen how many like kids clothes I'm folding and making the dinner and da, 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 da. And right. so, you know, all we did was say, you need to go home and like tell your husband that you have control over the sex button, meaning like whether it goes or not. And like giving hit her like sexy leers isn't what's going to do it. So he needs to figure it out. And she'd start coming home and like dinner was being cooked. The laundry was done. There was a bathtub drawn for her. Hey. She was on the verge of divorce, <laughs> right. like initiating sex with her. Like, cause it was literally just feeling this, like you've just put another thing on my to-do list. And when, right. and when they were able to talk about and realize like when she had the power he realized he needed to take some things off her to-do list. And that was mm -hmm. an amazing, like, so it doesn't have to be complicated. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes just finding the right things, being able to talk to somebody about, you know, uh, because sometimes your physicians will talk about it, but sometimes not about what are sort of good quality vibrators. People will, I mean, I, I know you can go on Amazon, but sometimes talking with people who have talked with, many people who have had different kinds of problems will say, well, this one might be better. Some people prefer some of the new toys that have suction. Some people mm -hmm. prefer ones that have more G-spot stimu uh, stimulation because maybe like if for some reason you're having uh, like neuropathic pains that are going to your mm -hmm. clitoris, that doesn't mean it'll be in your G-spot too. Like, and mm -hmm. that's a great place to go. There's also all these other spots like that I've learned about, but like, so there's so many things. And so, so I think the fact is, is you can read, but, and some people that's the way they learn, but actually being able to talk these through and sometimes having someone say like, there's actually a lot of different points and for homework, I'd like you to go home and explore each of these and kind of give me a feedback on like, where can you feel? Where does it feel good? Where does it hurt? Uh, and then you can kind of work to make a plan. So I, I don't think there's ever a wrong time. I'd say if you're frustrated, that's a good time. Right. To talk with right. Your doctor, and if your doctor can't help you with the frustration because it's so multifactorial also, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So awesome, awesome, awesome information. And so, um, Lara, you said something, right? You know, sometimes, especially with a diagnosis of a chronic illness, it can be really overwhelming and there's so much information. So what are good resources for people to tap into, like to get started, right? If they want to, you know, explore issues about um, sexual health or, you know, these types of things, like where do you go? Where do you start? So, I mean, so there's lots of, uh, there's more and more material coming out every day. I mean, so even if you just Google like, uh, like sex and MS, like all of the organizations now have information on it because it's become a much more- It was not, not always that way. It was not that way. No, it was not that way. And so, so all of them do. Uh, there are a couple of really some decent books related to sex and disability that have come out in the last few years that I was looking mm -hmm. at. Um, mm -hmm. One of them, I just wrote them down so because I wanted to make sure I gave good. So the ultimate guide to sex and disability is one of mm -hmm. them. Um, and and then there's another one that was like called like a easy guide to sex and disability. And both of those are on Amazon. And I read through them. I looked through the table of contents. I read the, the reviews of them and they all seem very hands on. I also really like uh, as a just a general book, like the guide to getting it on. Uh, I like the name of the book. I like that it's like 3,000 pages of information for 3,000. It's like, well, maybe it's, I might be exaggerating. It's over a thousand, uh, you know, and it was uh, actually given to me the first time on uh, one of the MS cruise events. And 
the naturopath who was there gave this to me because I was giving a talk on sex. He's like, have you seen this? And it's a fun book. I also think the book is not overly uh, heterosexually focused. So Mm -hmm. uh, I think it applies to people from all different backgrounds and in all kinds of relationships, acknowledging that uh, we're not just talking about couples anymore, you know, that the people have all different kinds of uh, uh, varying organizations of what their relationships look like. And so I find this book very respectful to that. So it's a good one if you just kind of want to know about things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's got like just 30 chapters of just like down to like, you know, uh, you know, a whole chapter on here's how you use your fingers, 30 pages, like, you know. 30 pages. Uh, <laughs> gotcha. Right. Dr. Williams' bedtime reading, clearly. I know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, I'll have it on my, my, my nightstand soon. <laughs> for research, uh, of course. For research purposes. For research, of course. <laughs> yes. you know, and what about also, you? Yeah, go, go ahead, ahead Arne. So I like Come As You Are. It's a book mm-hmm. um, that's uh, for women. Um, for men, there's a book called Good Enough Sex. And that's really about... It's about aging, but it it is very um, appropriate for chronic illness. And that is one of those books that sort of helps you open up your definition of sex. And the author is, you know, he, he's like, if you if you really are open to this, you can have great sex into your 90s, right? Because, mm-hmm. and, and like I said, it's about aging, but it's very appropriate for, for chronic illness. Um, and then there's a website, omgs.com. Um, which is about exploring your body and finding the places that, um, finding the things that bring you pleasure and and finding your orgasm without chasing it, (laughs) right? So again, we're not chasing it, but they do feel good. Um, And so it's about what, how to explore, explore yourself. Um, And it's not, uh, it's not part, it's not necessarily partner focused. Mm -hmm. Because I think interestingly enough, you know, um, you know, these desires and things don't go away as we get older. I remember Lara and I were doing a talk in Florida. You remember that, Lara? And we were. uh, Our audience was like 75 and up. Everybody was like 75 and up. And so we're giving this talk. Right. And so, you know, we've got a table in the back and they've got all kinds of samples and products and, you know, toys back there. And uh, we're doing this sex trivia. And so halfway through the program, we sit down and we're like, oh my God, we're bombing. Like we're bombing. And at the end, everyone was like, this was the best program we ever went to. You know, just like this 80 year old guy with this big pillow walking out. I mean, you know, so these are things that, you know, need to be continually talked about because, you know, this is a part of life until indefinitely. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we can't say that, you know, once you get a certain age, we don't have to pay attention to it. We don't um, we don't want to neglect it. So we are coming kind of toward the end. We've been having this amazing discussion. I will pause for a few seconds to see if anybody has questions that they want to put in the chat. Um, Please feel free to put those questions in the chat. I'm just going to scroll back through. I think I saw maybe one or two. Um, some of which we've addressed already. Um, I think one person asked what causes the lack of sensation. They've never heard of that before. And um, I'll answer that one. So, you know, with multiple sclerosis, uh, people can have lesions or damage to the spinal cord. And the spinal cord essentially um, affects everything you know, from that area down. So sometimes lesions in the spinal cord or damage to those nerves can cause abnormal feeling or sensation. Sometimes it's in the legs, more commonly it's in the arms and legs, but sometimes people can have abnormal sensation in the genital area uh, where there either is numbness or lack of sensation, or sometimes they can have that burning sensation or pins and needles sensation. So it can be a positive, uh, positive meaning an extra sensation that's not supposed to be there or the absence of sensation. And so those are both issues uh, related to um, sexual dysfunction that we see with multiple sclerosis. All right. And I'll see if anybody has any other questions in the chat. I don't see any so far. All right. So tell me, uh, so ladies, tell me where people can find you if they want to come see you. I know that you're busy and probably packed to the max, but how can people um, come and see you if they're in your area? 
So you can find me on pos be positively intimate.com. So B E positively intimate.com. Um, there you can set up a free consultation. Um, I am completely virtual right now. Um, so I'm licensed in Georgia, but I'm also a member of the, uh, of a, a pit, which gives me telehealth transportability to several states. I think it's, they keep adding states every month, so I can't keep up with the number. It was somewhere around 17 the last time I checked um, different states. So awesome. if you, you can always do the free consultation and we can determine if one of the, you know, if I would work um, for you for one of the states, uh, for the state that you're in. Okay. And you do new consultations over the computer. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right. Dr. Steppelman, I know that you're also packed to the max. Uh, I am back to the, I'm packed to the gills, but I'm also happy to just chat with people or answer questions. Uh, Mitzi, you might remember that like my, you know, favorite thing was because when I would meet with people live, I'd give out my card. I'd be like, you did and everything. your email address. <laughs> right. Right. Everything. So, uh, and so you can find that I'm on the, uh, Augusta University site in the Department of Psychiatry and Health Behavior. And I have a uh, profile there with my email on it. Um, but but a woman from the Florida one, that was the funniest thing, called me like a year afterwards because she had Did my she? car. And wow. she was like, I'm going on vacation. Like she was like, she'd just gone through a divorce and we'd mm -hmm. both gone through divorces at similar times. And so we were sort of bonding over that. And like, she called me like a year later. She's like, I have a boyfriend. I'm like, congratulations. Mm -hmm. and she's like, and I'm about to travel. And the vibrator that I use is a Hitachi. So for anyone that doesn't know the Hitachi and hasn't gotten it yet, it's like, this big well i mean this it's big it's a lot to travel with for like a mm -hmm. weekend travel on a plane and so she was like i need something that has the same power but it's like half the size and mm. like that became like my goal for the day i was like i will find something with the same vpn vibrations per minute uh so that uh this woman can go away with her boyfriend uh, you know and have pleasure uh, and I, I felt like I won an Academy Award because someone contacted me to ask me a question from another state about a vibrator. So like, awesome. so, so don't be afraid to reach out like that. I mean, mm -hmm. that's how we get resources and share resources. And my hope is that she'll share what she learned with her friends and so on. So that, you know, so that everyone can get that kind of information. So absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I love it, ladies. This has been an amazing and enlightening conversation. And I hope that all of you that tuned in learned something from what we talked about tonight. Please share it uh, with your friends and with your families and your loved ones um, that are dealing with some of these issues. And again, a lot of this information is not just for people with chronic illness or MS. A lot of this information is for everybody, right? Everybody can benefit from this. So thank you all so much for sharing your time and your expertise. And thank you to all of my brain chat friends for tuning in this evening. We'll see you in two weeks and uh, have a wonderful, wonderful week. Thank you so much. Thank you.